Welcome, everyone. Um, glad to see you here. Um, on behalf of the Foreign Policy Initiative, I'd like to welcome you to our discussion today, Tibet and the Future of Asia, Strategic Issues for the United States, India, and the World. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting day to be here. I think you might have seen that uh, Secretary Clinton has left Beijing, and before she left, she said that uh, China-U.S. relations have never been better. Um, I think we all have different reasons for wondering if that's an accurate assessment of the situation. Uh, certainly, the Tibet issue is something that is uh, a, a, a big issue in U.S.-China uh, ties and something that um, FPI hopes will get greater attention uh, going forward. And that's why we've invited this uh, group of really expert people um, uh, on this topic to join us today. Um, very briefly, I know you have their biographies. I'd just like to introduce them. Uh, Lodi Gary will speak first. He's the special envoy of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, and engaged in the, uh, the dialogue, the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, on his behalf. Uh, Ambassador Lalit Mansingh, the former uh, Indian Foreign Secretary, Ambassador to the United States and High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Brahma Chalani, a professor of strategic studies at the Center for Policy Research and the author of this very fine book that I recommend to you, which has not only very good treatment of water issues, but the Tibet historical perspective. Um, and uh, Mike Green, uh, who's the senior advisor and the holder of the Japan chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a former senior official at the National Security Council. Um, as is the custom, we are live tweeting this event, my, my colleagues are, and the hashtag is FPI Tibet. Um, we will uh, have the audio of this event up on the web soon and um, look forward to having our speakers each speak for about 15 minutes um, and then engage in discussion with all of, with all of you. So Lodi, thank you very much. Please, please go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, Ellen, for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, discussion. Uh, I think today I'm here more as an uh, on-the-job trend expert uh, rather than as the special envoy, because uh, in that regard, uh, I'm afraid I really don't have anything to report back. Uh, it's been more than uh, two years since uh, I've been able to uh, reconnect with uh, my counterparts in Beijing. Uh, even though I uh, did hope uh, that uh, I may be able to help. Also, we had you know, historic transition in Dharamshala. And I felt that uh, you know, you know, I owed to the new leadership that I make one last effort so that uh, at least the fragile relation between Dharamshala and Beijing is maintained. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it didn't happen uh, for the last two years. Now with the situation in China, and also because we are on eve of major leadership change uh, in China, I uh, you know, do not really see any prospect of early resumption of the talks, uh, at least during my watch. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I'm really delighted that uh, uh, the Foreign Policy Initiative you know, felt at time uh, to discuss Tibet in a larger context. Uh, in, fa in fact, I feel this is the right approach because uh, you know, last many years I've been up here elsewhere trying to plead our case. And I always felt that even those who did listen to us, they were doing it because they felt sorry for us, sympathy for us, not really so much that Tibet is also relevant to them. And, uh, and we, you know, as a kind of in our culture, we're a little shy to, you know, be kind of uh, uh, outspoken to say that, you know, my issue is not only important to me, but also important to you. But uh, uh, so, so therefore, I'm really delighted. And also to be here with, uh, you know, a panel that really has tremendous experience both uh, from their background uh, and foreign services, uh, but also as, as a scholars. In fact, I felt kind of you know, reluctant to be the first speaker because uh, I would have uh, been more happy to be the last speaker because I would have uh, you see, learned a lot and then most probably also be able to kind of uh, get some inspiration or wisdom. But then since this is a Tibet topic, and I think Ellen was right in uh, you know, asking me to be the, the, the first you know, speaker. Um, you know, as I said earlier that, you see, I'm kind of an expert, uh, you know, 
uh, not by learning, but on the job training. And I think I have had considerable personal experience uh, uh, having been brought up in India, which actually, you know, I consider, in fact, not only my second home. In absence of home, I still consider India as my home. Uh, and then, you see, last more than 20 years, you know, here in the United States. And then also, I have been dealing with the Chinese government for 30 years. I just realized, you know, just a couple of days back, when I was just going through some up and nots, I went to Beijing first time in 1982. So. It's been a very long period of time. So I do have, I think, some personal kind of, uh, let's say, you know, experience. In this regard, uh, you know, Ambassador Mansing, you know, will know that I have always, you know, candidly, because I've been fortunate to have a personal friendship with many of the senior Indian government officials, you know, such as uh, Ambassador Mansing, who's been my mentor, and also I think I can call him, a, you know, friend that even with regard to India's relation with China, which is no doubt very, very important, also a relation that will impact on all of us, even the United States, India-China relation. I have always very candidly told Indian, uh, you know, foreign policy people that, uh, you know, you should really not shy away from discussing about Tibet. Uh, you see, when uh, Indian foreign officials kind of uh, reassure the Chinese counterparts whenever, you know, Chinese make a big noise about, you know, uh, Tibet, uh, you know, by saying that, oh, you see, that's your domestic affair. We don't want to really interfere. Of course, His Holiness is, you know, religious leader. We respect him. But beyond that, you see, is your kind of your business and we really have uh, no interest. You know, I used to tell them very candidly, don't say that, because when you say that, they become even more suspicious. Then they really become, yes, indeed, India has a hidden agenda, because I mean, any person who knows kind of the elementary, uh, you know, knowledge of uh, the China, you know, India relation, I mean, it will be, you see, quite foolish to think that, for example, India and China can have a, a normal, you know, relation without the Tibet issue being resolved, without Tibet, you know, being restored at least its genuine autonomy. And therefore, you see, this is one reason why I said I'm very happy. Similarly, I think even, you know, uh, you know here in the United States, uh, you know, there's this I mean, notion sometimes, you see, because now we're in election circle again. You know, so quite often, uh, unfortunately, even the Chinese think that, oh, when there's election, you know, then there'll be some rhetorics about Tibet. And once that is over, you see, then you see business as usual, you know, Tibet is really not important. But the fact is, uh, you know, the politicians need to make a rhetoric about Tibet during election time. Does clearly said that there's somewhere out there, there is a very strong, you know, an American public interest on Tibet. So therefore, you see, I, I do hope that you see, because otherwise, again, the, you know, the, 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 the people in Beijing always think, oh, this is just will go away. I don't think it will go away, and in fact, you know, I feel you know, very gratified that the, sometimes I myself really do not know exactly what are the reasons, but there is tremendous uh, you know, sympathy and understanding you know, for Tibet, even you know, uh, you know, here in this country. So therefore, that, that's why I really wanted to say you know, uh, I, I'm you know, uh, grateful that this you know, uh, kind of uh, discussion is happening. Now, for example, you know, we you know, had a lovely you know, dinner last night with uh, some of us on the panel, uh, and uh, uh, Ambassador Mansing you know, you know, made uh, you know, very, very, I think, uh, important uh, remarks, which I'm sure he will share with you. But during those discussions, there was also, for example, you know, discussion. Now, you have, uh, you see, India, you know, US relation is definitely, you know, uh, totally different than what used to be, uh, you know, 15, 20 years back. And you have all kind of dialogues happening. Uh, and then some of those dialogues are very specific. For example, you know, it's not your assistant secretary for South Asia, but sometimes even your assistant secretary for Asia Pacific uh, goes to Delhi quite often to have a dialogue with his counterparts. So obviously, you know, I'm sure you see China must be one of the most important issue on the agenda. And if that is the case, then it is also very important that, you know, Tibet be, you know, discussed. Because, again, uh, you, know, uh, you know, for India-China relation, and by extension, therefore, uh, India-China-US relation, 
cannot be dealt with unless you are willing to uh, openly, candidly discuss. Now, by this, I, you know, uh, I'm not trying at all that there be a conspiracy, you know, between people to weaken China, to, to, to disintegrate China. On the contrary, I think candid discussions among the major players is important so that, in fact, you know, China becomes a stable, but a, a partner that you can rely on. I mean, you know, last few, you know, last few days, we have been witnessing uh, some interesting things that happens, which clearly demonstrates once again, one, that there is no harmony, because even though this is a big slogan, not ha no harmony even within the system itself, even within the system. Forget about harmony between the different nationalities, but even the harmony within the very rigid uh, Communist Party system seems to be now really <coughs> uh, very, very fragile. It also clearly shows that an absence of rule of law, you see, because when, you see, even two individuals give, you know, honorable commitment, you know, we wanted to see that is honored. But particularly when two big nations, you know, sp people speaking on behalf of two entities, two of the most important, when that also is kind of not honored. So these are signs, you see, that things are not as healthy, uh, maybe prosperous, you see, at some level, in China. Uh, so therefore, again, I think it is really, you know, very, very important, you know, uh, you know that th these things are discussed in a very serious manner. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, I myself, you know, since I had clearly indicated that uh, uh, the possibilities of a meaningful dialogue, you know, I mean, at least, you know, uh, doing my watch, you know, I think is unrealistic. However, I passionately believe, passionately believe that ultimately, for the Tibetan people, for the Chinese people, and also in, in a larger context, even to help India-China relation, help even a broader, you know, U.S.-China relation, that Tibet issue need to be resolved, and the only way I see is through dialogue, through dialogue. And also I do hope, this has been my mantra, whenever I go to Beijing, to my Chinese counterparts, take advantage of presence of His Holiness to resolve this issue. Uh, and my belief, even though he has very courageously, with a far-sightedness, has uh, you know, retired from his political responsibilities, but uh, the person of Dalai Lama, whether you know, uh, you know, he is a head of a state or a head of a government or whatever, you know, it will be a key factor uh, and, and help resolve this issue. Because one has to have not only the moral but historical uh, credibility, uh, status. Uh, so I, I still do, do hope. And this is something that I think, uh, not only Chinese, uh, if you do believe then is important for countries such as India, who's been very, very generous, very kind host to His Holiness and uh, all the Tibetans, but to give uh, even more visibility uh, to the important role of His Holiness. Similarly, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to urge, you know, that United States, you see, of course, uh, compared with the other countries, uh, United States, you know, have been much more visible, and obviously because also by law, I, I think, you know, I'm very happy that we're meeting here, you know, in one of the Senate rooms, because it is actually, you know, the, the Congress that, you know, by law made it uh, almost, you know, necessary. Uh, you know, for example, we have uh, in the State Department where, you know, some 20 years back, I was not even allowed to enter. Uh, we now have on the seventh floor, uh, you know, uh, office for, you know, for the special coordinator of Tibetan issues. So th these, are, these are the right things to do, but I wanted to see more visible engagement by world leaders. Similarly, since the Tibetans have now democratic institutions, they have had elections, you know, they have a person, you know, who's directly elected, head the government, and also those people must be engaged. You know, you know how you engage, in what manner, these are, you see, should be handled, I fully understand. But the most important is if you wanted to help, then you have to engage. You, see, you can't help resolve by only engaging with one party and being shy to engage you know, with, with the other. So, so this is a, 
something I wanted to again share with you because under the kind of, you know, this, you know the Chinese have been very, very s clever. I mean, I mean, very smart also. And making people believe this so-called one China concept, I mean, which you all know, this, this, this audience knows, but you know, in Europe, for example, you know, there's very little knowledge, unfortunately, even among senior people who are conducting the foreign policy about one China concept. So you see, uh, you know, this has no relevance. So that's, you know, one thing that I wanted to, you know, uh, urge. But then I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I will leave it right here because I think, you know, quite a few of the things that I wanted to s share with you will be more, I think, eloquently done by, you know, the others who will speak. So once again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lodi, and look forward to pursuing some of that uh, later on with the questions. Um, Ambassador Mansing, if you would, please. <coughs> thank you, Elin, and I want to thank the Foreign Policy Initiative for inviting me for this very important uh, conference. Uh, it's a hard act to follow Lodi because I can't think of anybody who knows the Tibet issues better and more clearly than my good friend, Dr. Lodi Kari. Well, I will try. There's a saying that when elephants fight, the grass gets trampled upon. And in this case, I think the grass is the unfortunate people of Tibet. And the two elephants are the two largest countries in the world with the two largest armies and possibly in the near future, the two largest economies. Um, will Tibet be the next uh, global battle, battlefield in Asia after Iraq, Afghanistan? Unlikely, but it's not ruled out because what we are seeing is rising tension between India and China. And therefore, it may well be the next battlefield, which is why it is very important that the three countries involved, China, India, and the United States, must actually focus attention on Tibet and make sure that a confrontation does not take place. How important is Tibet for India? The simple answer is we have differences with China over seven major areas, seven major issues. Five of these relate to Tibet. So I would think that the one area of agreement we have with China is in understanding that Tibet is a core issue. The Chinese have said it openly. Indians have been in denial, but there is no question in my mind that Tibet is a core issue between us and China and is one of the major issues that the world needs to focus on. Now, um, let's quickly look at the seven areas of difference and see how Tibet features in this. First and foremost is the territorial dispute between China and India. We have 4,000 odd kilometers of unsettled uh, border between China and India. It's not as if we have not been trying to find a solution, but there is no solution as of now. And therefore, I'm a little pessimistic as to whether we are heading towards an understanding with China on this very important issue. Now, just recently, in the middle of January, the special representatives of India and China met in New Delhi to discuss the border issue. And if you go by the statements that were issued, it, it sounds very, very hopeful. Uh, the, the Chinese representative, Dai Bingo, said we have scaled new heights. And he said we are looking forward to a golden period in our bilateral relations. And our national security advisor, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon, called the talks wide-ranging, productive, forward-looking. So, I mean, uh, even for me, as a veteran in the field, this is breathtakingly brilliant in its euphemism. I wish I could say that uh, this was productive, forward-looking. We're looking at a golden period. I'm afraid it is not so. The fact is, the talks are going nowhere. And this is the structure of the talks. This is the highest level at which the boundary issue has been discussed in the recent years between the uh, senior vice minister on the Chinese side and the national security advisor on the Indian side. Now, uh, 15 rounds of special representative talks have taken place. And this followed 15 rounds of talks at the level of the foreign secretary and the deputy minister on the Chinese side, which was preceded by eight rounds of talks at the joint secretary level between the two sides. 
And mind you, if you really go back, the talk started in the 1960s at the level of the prime ministers of the two countries between Jawaharlal Nehru and Chou Enlai. So if after more than 60 years we are going nowhere, I don't see any solution in sight. And therefore, I'm a little worried that the boundary dispute, instead of getting better, is actually getting worse. What we are seeing is China making more and more strident claims on Indian territory, not forgetting the fact that China is actually sitting on about 45,000 square kilometers of Indian territory. And I don't see any signs that they want to negotiate the return of these territories. So uh, things are not getting better. And in fact, if you, if you look at recent history, things have become a little more difficult on the border. The second issue on which we have real concerns, the nexus between China and Pakistan. There has been a quasi-military alliance under which China has transferred nuclear, missile, and military technology to Pakistan. Um, since uh, 1971, um, in a move led by President Nixon and uh, pushed forward by Henry Kissinger, there has been a new relationship which was brokered by the United States, and it's a relationship between China and Pakistan. It was, uh, it's been a very unique kind of partnership which continues, and the impact is felt in India because we are facing the combined hostility of two of our neighbors, China and Pakistan. Third area, of concern for India is China's growing presence in India's immediate neighborhood. China has aggressively moved into neighboring countries like Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, is attempting to get a foothold in, in Bangladesh, in, in, uh, in the Maldives, and of course, it has a very strong presence in Pakistan. Um, this is of great concern to India and uh, our, our strategic thinkers are really worried about it. Number four, ecological changes in Tibet, which will inevitably affect India. Now, the very fragile and pristine ecological balance which was there in Tibet over the millennia is now being disturbed by massive projects being undertaken by the Chinese there in terms of roads, railways, military establishments, and ex extensive exploitation of minerals. I think it's, it's time that the world took notice of what impact this could have, not only on, on South Asia and India in particular, but on the world in general. Number five is a project that is of immense concern to us. It is called the SNWP, the South to North Water Project, under which the waters of, of the Tibetan area are going to be diverted to northern China. Now, this will have, this will have catastrophic consequences on India and Bangladesh, especially if the waters of the Brahmaputra are diverted away from India. Uh, number six is China's opposition to India's membership of regional and global organizations. It is well known that China was not keen for India to be admitted to the East Asia Summit but we had other friends who helped us to get in. China still keeps us at arm's length in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's unlikely that it will agree to India becoming a full-scale member. China is actively opposed to India being a permanent member of the UN Security Council when it is expanded, even though four out of the five permanent members of the Security Council have publicly expressed support for India. Number seven, is a maritime threat which is uh, being recognized uh, in more recent times. China's growing military presence in the Indian Ocean area and China's claims to have a special status in the Indian Ocean and in the South China Seas. So um, um, I, there is a growing feeling that we are not coming closer in terms of our political understanding. And therefore, there is a huge question mark as to which way India-China relations are going. But when you look at Tibet, which as I said, is a core issue 
five out of the seven uh, points of difference relate to Tibet. A large part of the responsibility, I must uh, confess, has been because of India not following the right policies. And here I make it clear, I don't speak for the government of India, but these are views I, I have held, and I have said this before in Indian audience, therefore I don't mind sharing with you. We committed five major errors of judgment with regard to Tibet. And these were errors of judgment which are becoming apparent by hindsight. It's not as if Prime Minister Nehru was dealing with China at that time, uh, had malified the intents towards Tibet, but it did happen that he took the Chinese leaders on trust and on a number of issues, he was deceived and misled. But nevertheless, history will record that these were errors of judgment. So let me relate these five errors of judgment according to me. One, Nehru believed that China and India will join hands and take the leadership in bringing about an Asian renaissance in the 20th century. As it turned out, China had no interest in this. And China uh, had, had uh, uh, no desire to join India in bringing about a renaissance in Asia. China was not interested in Asia or any other place. China was simply interested in itself. The second error we made was in believing the Chinese assurances that the maps they were publishing on the border were, according to the Chinese leaders, old, outdated Kuomintang maps, and don't worry, in due course, they will be rectified. They were never rectified, and we now know the Chinese had no intention of rectifying the maps. Number three, Chinese assurances, especially at the level of Chao Lai to Nehru, that the Dalai Lama's security would be looked after, the welfare of the Tibetan people will be secure. This did not happen. And we all know how, how instead of looking after the security of the Tibetan people, actually the Dalai Lama was hounded out of Tibet, and Tibet was increasingly brutalized under Chinese rule. Number four, India failed to demand reciprocity from China in its dealings with China. And this was an a huge error of judgment. Because when China virtually uh, uh, coerced us into subscribing to the One China policy and making it a mantra in statement after statement, India could have easily said, well, if you have to subscribe to a One China policy, how about you are subscribing to a One India policy? How about showing respect for India's territorial integrity? How about supporting India on Jammu and Kashmir? None of that happened. So I, I'm afraid we missed opportunities in the past, but I hope we will not miss opportunities in the future to demand reciprocity from China. And finally, India has been passive about this uh, south to north water project, and I think the time has come when India must take it up as a major issue with, with Tibet. So instead of helping in the situation in Tibet, Actually, India looked on whilst the situation got worse in Tibet. Uh, India did virtually nothing when uh, Lhasa was occupied, and we know what happened thereafter. Um, India did nothing when the 17-point agreement was forced on the, the Dalai Lama, who was in no position to negotiate on equal terms with China. And the most tragic error, in my view, is the 1954 agreement which we signed with China. Ironically, uh, the title of this agreement uh, refers to uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, Tibetan Buddhist doctrine of Panchashila. Um, the Panchashila agreement was uh, tragic in my view because India surrendered whatever rights it had in Tibet historically and legally. And therefore, um, I, uh, we are running out of time. So let me, let me uh, summarize what I think the concerned government should do. I think so far as India is concerned, I would suggest five uh, major changes in our policy on Tibet and a fresh look at Tibet. India, one, India must make the Tibetan cause an Indian cause. 
and raise the issue of Tibet in our bilateral discussions with China and internationally with the international community. India must remove whatever restrictions there are on the movement of the Dalai Lama, the Karmapa, and senior Tibetan leaders. Number two, uh, India must take the lead in preserving the uh, spiritual, cultural, and religious heritage of Tibet. After all, Tibet did India a favor in protecting Buddhism when Buddhism had been wiped out of India. I think we need to return the favor. Number three, it's time to uh, remove the refugee tag from our Tibetan friends who have grown up in India who consider India their home. I don't think they're refugees anymore. If they opt to become Indian citizens, the government of India should allow this. And Tibetans must be given the same freedoms which we give to our neighbors in Nepal and Bhutan. Number four, India must apply reciprocity. India has done that in a recent case when Prime Minister Wen Chaobao came to Delhi in 2010, and I hope that India will follow this. And finally, India must very vigorously and publicly take up the case of the ecological changes and the reports about the diversion of the waters of the Brahmaputra. My um, wish list for China is that China must recognize the significance of the 19th March 2011 declaration of the Dalai Lama. This creates an entirely new situation in the Tibetan uh, uh, issue. And therefore, China must take advantage of the fact that now there is a separation of political and spiritual power. And I think it is in the interest of China to renew the negotiations which were being led by uh, Dr. Lodi Gyari, because I think this is the right moment for China, because things are not going to get better in Tibet if China pursues its policy of aggressiveness in Tibet. In fact, the best basis for a settlement is what the Dalai Lama has proposed in terms of his five-point peace plan of September 1957, and the clarifications he gave later on, uh, which is in 1988, which are known as the Strasbourg proposal. And finally, this is my wish list for Washington, since we are here. I hope Washington is listening. Tibet, Tibet must be acknowledged as an area for discussion in our bilateral discussions with uh, the United States. It must be a part of the Indo-US strategic dialogue. After all, the Indo-US strategic partnership is based on shared values and shared interests. And I can see, of, I can see no other issue on which there is a coincidence of shared issues and shared interests, as in the case of Tibet. I remember that when Secretary of State Hillary Clinton came to Chennai last year, she gave a landmark speech in which she was trying to shake India from its passivity, and she was saying, uh, look East, talk East, engage East, act East. So in the same spirit, I'd like to uh, tell our American friends, well, the time has come for you to talk, talk Tibet, engage Tibet, and urge China to look at Tibet more constructively and more compassionately. Thank you. Thank you very much. A quick question. Is there any chance that you might become foreign secretary again? Uh, <laughs> very, no. It would, it would, it would, impossible. If, if only. Yes. Thank you very much for, for those detailed remarks. Um, now, uh, Dr. Chelaney, please. Thank you. I'll divide my presentation in two parts. In the first part, I'll look at um, how China's political future might evolve. After all, the future of Tibet is very much linked with the future direction of China. And in the second part, I'll discuss what value Tibet holds for China and the rest of the world. It's very difficult to predict China's future, but one thing is certain, that China's future will be determined not by its economics, it's a hugely successful economy, its future will be determined by its politics. A reminder of that is the ongoing vicious power struggle that has broken out in China in the run-up to the leadership changes. And the downfall of Bo Lai is just one example, just one example of how vicious this past struggle is. 
I can think of five possible scenarios in terms of China's political future. In scenario one, the status quo prevails. The Communist Party is able to protect its legitimacy, keep the military, keeps the military subservient to the party, and manages to put a lid on popular dissent. I think this scenario is the least likely of the five scenarios simply because China is at the crossroads and maintaining the status quo for too long may not be possible. In scenario two, China implodes. This is the scenario opposite to scenario one. How likely is that scenario? Here, one has to bear in mind two important facts. China is the only country in the world I'm aware of whose internal security budget, official internal security budget, is higher than its official national defense budget. This tells you how much the Chinese state relies on internal repression to maintain one-party rule and to control ethnic minority homelands, which make up 60% of China's landmass today. Territorially, Han Par is at its zenith. If you compare today's PRC with the last Han Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, China's territorial size is three times bigger. But the territorial redrawing of frontiers has not stopped. An example of that is China's increasingly aggressive claim to India's northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh, which is three times larger than Taiwan. The question is, can this large, powerful, repressive machinery allow the Chinese state to unravel? First, bear in mind that China is not the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, the party was the state and the state was the party. China has a large institutional capacity plus a very powerful, institutionally strong PLA. So in my view, the implosion is unlikely. Now that brings me to scenario three, which is a gradual process of political reforms begins in keeping with Premier Wen Jiabao's recent warning that China faces the prospect of chaos without, quote unquote, urgent fundamental political reforms. Nice words from Wen Jiabao, but the third generation leaders who are going to take over the reins of power, are they political reformers? It's an important question to ask. In my view, these third generation leaders are pretty scarred. In fact, they're trapped in the very political culture that led to the death of millions of Chinese since 1949 and to this repressive machinery being built up. To me, they look like anything but political reformers. Scenario four, a new cultural revolution breaks out with the clique in power seeking to ruthlessly suppress dissent within the establishment and outside the establishment. The Dalai Lama recently warned that there are plenty of worshippers of the gun in the Chinese establishment. And the fifth scenario, which is the most troubling, and in my view, in my view the most likely scenario, is the military increasingly calling the shots with the civilians in power beholden to the military. As the party's legitimacy has come under pressure, 
the PLA generals have begun to assert themselves increasingly. Often they misspeak in public now. In recent years, they have repeatedly embarrassed the Chinese foreign policy establishment by misspeaking on various issues, on US policy, on policy towards China's neighbors, and creating diplomatic problems for the establishment. This is just an example of how the power of the generals is growing. Another example is the role of the military in the current power struggle. I have found it very unusual that in recent weeks, a series of articles have appeared in the official newspapers written by serving senior military officers calling for party discipline and unity and alluding to the party's role, sorry, to the military's role in maintaining party discipline and unity. So in this scenario, the military will rule with a civilian face. Now that takes me to the second part of the presentation. What value does the Tibetan plateau hold for China and the rest of the world? First, I should, before I explain the value of Tibet, China has pursued a five-pronged strategy to assert its control over ethnic minority homelands. One is to cartographically alter ethnic homeland boundaries. That is, cartographically dismember the homelands of ethnic minorities. Second is to demographically flood non-Han cultures through this Go West Han migration campaign. The third is to rewrite history to justify Chinese control. Fourth is to enforce cultural homogeneity to help blur local ethnic identities. And fifth is to maintain political repression. All these things have been tried out in Tibet. This is as Tibet existed in this map in 1950-51, before China annexed it. This, as you can see in this map, this, this independent self-governing Tibet had three areas, Utsang, the central plateau, Amdo, and Kham. Amdo largely has been made the Qinghai province. Kham has been merged with, um, with uh, the Chinese provinces of Yunnan and Sichuan, and a part of Amdo has gone to Gansu. So what remains is only half of the original Tibet. This is how Tibet looks today. Only the central plateau is left, which the Chinese government calls the Tibet Autonomous Region. And 60% of the Tibetans now live outside the part that is called TAR, or Tibet Autonomous Region. When the Manchus ruled China, the Qing Dynasty was the Manchu Dynasty, the name for Tibet that was coined was Xijiang. Xijiang means the Western Treasure Land. And it indeed is a treasure trove of resources. Look at this. It's a treasure trove of 132 minerals that are found on the Tibetan plateau. The biggest reserves of 10 different metals are in Tibet. Tibet is the world's number one producer of um, lithium. So there's a little of Tibet in every handheld device that we possess. And having depleted its own resources, China is now draining the resources of Tibet. The extension of the railroad to Tibet, the building of the railroad from Gormu to Lhasa, and then its extension to Shigatse, which is the second largest city in Tibet, has enabled China 
to step up its extraction of Tibet's natural resources. But this focus on natural resources has turned out to be a resource curse for Tibetan communities. It's become a huge burden for local communities because mining and other activities are exacting a serious environmental toll, polluting water resources, creating other kinds of eco ecological problems. But this is not the full story. Look at this map now. What does it show? It shows that most of Asia's major rivers originate in one area, the Tibetan Plateau. There is no other part in the world which compares with the water richness of the Tibetan Plateau. All of Asia's biggest rivers, except the Ganges, originate in just one area, the Tibetan Plateau. The Tibetan Plateau has a triple role to play. It's the world's largest accessible freshwater repository. There is more fresh water in the North Pole and the South Pole, but that water is all frozen. It's all frozen, it's all ice. The Tibetan Plateau fresh water is largely accessible. And therefore, it's called the third pole, but in actual accessible freshwater resources, it's the world's largest water repository. Second, the Tibetan Plateau is the largest supplier of fresh water in the world. It supplies fresh water through its river systems to nearly half the world's population. Living in mainland China, the whole of Southeast Asia, South Asia, and parts of Central Asia. And the third role that Tibetan Plateau has is, is that it's a rainmaker. How does it make rain? Because of its very high altitude, it heats up in summer, acts as a heat pump, draws in monsoonal currents from different oceans, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, the Bay of Bengal, Indian Ocean, and the Arabian Sea. That's how the famous Asian monsoons develop every summer. Now this is, these are two satellite pictures taken 42 years apart. That shows the devastation caused to Tibet under Chinese rule. Satellite pictures that tell the story of how deforestation has happened. The dark blue and the light blue spots that you see are different types of forests in Tibet. The major rivers of Tibet originate in the south, southern belt of Tibet and in the eastern area. If you just look at this map, if you see this map, the rivers originate in the south and the eastern part. Rest of Tibet is arid. And this is exactly where the rich forests were located in 1950. Now see the bottom map. Most of those forests are gone. By 1992, large parts of the water-rich southern and eastern belt have been denuded of their rich forests. And studies by Chinese scholars published in international journals show that since the early 1990s, land transformation through conversion of forests and grasslands to cropland and other use continues. Now China's control of Tibet's water resources has important strategic implications for Asia given the fact that water stress in Asia is a big issue. The world's driest continent is not Africa but Asia as you can see from this map. Ambassador Man Singh spoke about this great south-north water transfer project. In China, China's actually two countries in terms of water resources. The south holds most of the water, the north is largely semi-arid. But the north is the food bowl of China, 
and it's also the industrial heartland of China. So to perpetuate this paradox of the north, the water scarce north being the food supply to the south and the industrial heartland, China is taking water from the south to the north by canals. The eastern route is largely complete and functional. The central route will be complete by 2014 and then after 2014, the western route taking Tibetan waters northwards will be started. And this has important implications for all the countries located downstream in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and parts of Central Asia. This is a map that shows new dam projects approved in China. This is a map released by China's biggest dam builder, Hydro China Corporation, a year and a half ago. And it shows the new dams that will come up. The big dams in this map, the mega dams, are, are all coming up in the borderlands on international rivers. There are 50,000 large dams in the world, 50,000. And do you know, more than half are in just one country, China. China is the most dammed country in the world. It has 26,000 large dams, and yet this dam building spree, far from actually slowing, is picking up momentum as this official map of new dams shows. China has 12 riparian neighbors, that is countries with which it shares water resources. Rivers originating in Chinese territory flow to these other countries. But China does not have a single water sharing treaty with any country. Why? Because it asserts the principle of absolute territorial sovereignty, which means that a country has the right to divert as much water as it wishes from an international river, irrespective of the impact on downstream states. So we have countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia that are bound by water treaties that they have negotiated. But China is one country that, is, that does not even believe in the concept of water sharing. My time is up, so I will uh, stop here and conclude by saying two things. First, that Tibet is not an issue just between China and Tibet. This is an issue tied to international security and Asian security. U.S. interests in Asia are also at stake. But more fundamentally, Asia's environmental future is very much tied with Tibet. And the environmental degradation that we are seeing in Tibet because of reckless human practices holds important long-term implications for Asian states. Lastly, Tibet has been turned into a moral issue and pushed to the sidelines. It's important to bring this issue back to the center stage. And the responsibility to protect norm must apply as much to Tibet as to any other human rights abusing state. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was com very compelling. Um, uh, Mike Green, if you would finish it up for us. Thank you. Um, going to bat after those three remarkable presentations is uh, a bit daunting, but um, Brahma has uh, ended with exactly the point that I want to pick up with to conclude our discussions today. I think most of us, if not all of us, are here and care about this issue primarily because it, it wounds our hearts to see the uh, effect of Chinese rule on the culture, um, the human rights, uh, the dignity, and the ecosystem of Tibet. <clears throat> but we're not likely to make the kind of progress uh, we need um, if we um, treat this as a moral issue, um, divorced from, as Brahma suggested, divorced from the strategic interests of the major powers uh, around China, um, particularly the United States and India, but including Japan, Australia, and others as well in, in the European Union. Um, so let me f uh, end uh, today's panel by focusing uh, a bit on grand strategy. 
um, which is not usually the way that debt issue is discussed, but I applaud FPI for, for framing it in those terms because in this town, that's, that's one way you, you, make, you make progress. Um, appealing to the heart um, is not always, um, uh, it's necessary, but not always sufficient in this town or any other capital. Um, let me briefly touch on what I think are the um, uh, strategic interests and concerns of China. Uh, Brahma and Lalit have done some of that. <clears throat> and then turn to um, what I think are U.S. geostrategic interests in the Tibet issue. Uh, the Chinese um, view of Tibet has been described well just now. I think there are five factors that are driving Chinese um, strategic thinking, though, at this point. Uh, the first is the fundamental concern that the CCP leadership has about sovereignty. And this is an issue of legitimacy, uh, even more than it is grand strategy. The CCP rests, uh, the CCP's legitimacy rests essentially on two pillars, economic growth, which is uneven, um, impressive, but uneven and fraught with complications, and um, the protection of China's territorial sovereignty and integrity after 100 years of shame um, at the hands of the Japanese and the Western powers. Um, and Tibet, of course, is at the center of that. Um, as you saw in the earlier slide, uh, Greater Tibet, um, if it were uh, independent or autonomous or beyond Beijing's control, would significantly shrink the size of the PRC. And the protests several years ago from Guizhou to Sichuan and, of course, in the TAR demonstrated how broad support for His Holiness and the cause of Tibetan autonomy is in Greater Tibet. So it's territorial sovereignty, uh, intense uh, uh, source of insecurity and concern for the leadership. Um, secondly, as Brahma just described, resources, and I won't say anything more than that, but I think it is important uh, to bear that in mind. Um, third, uh, also touched on briefly in earlier presentations, uh, is the effect of Tibetan Buddhism on the um, cohesion and uh, legitimacy of the CCP's uh, ideology and um, framework for social cohesion in China. Um, we hosted His Holiness uh, in 2010 at CSIS together with Brookings and the Asia Society, and in that uh, session, he described uh, the writings of Li Peng's former driver, former Premier Li Peng, the architect of the Tiananmen crackdown. And, um, and in, in his uh, uh, writings, the uh, driver for Li Peng said that Li Peng, at an old age, had committed, had, uh, had converted to Tibetan Buddhism. And His Holiness had a wonderful line. I don't know if any of you were there. I know you were. But he said, you know, when you're, when you're in your 80s, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, not so useful. <laughs> Um, and I think, as, uh, as, as someone suggested earlier, there is a much deeper and broader um, commitment to Tibetan Buddhism um, across China, uh, particularly Inner Mongolia, um, uh, but stretching essentially from Mongolia to the Himalayan Plateau, and within um, the metropolises and the eastern seaboard as well. Um, the legitimacy and autonomy um, of uh, Tibetan Buddhism as a spiritual movement, I think, is a cause of great concern for the Chinese leaders. And we need to not accept that, but understand it. <clears throat> Fourth, Tibet has been uh, the source of or the root for foreign incursions into China historically. Um, there are two areas I think the Chinese worry about strategically because of their history. One is the coast and the, uh, the, the first and second island chains, South China Sea, East China Sea, from which, from whence the British, the French, the Americans, the Western powers came, um, took Hong Kong, won the Opium Wars, and so forth. Um, the other is uh, Tibet. Um, the uh, Japanese in the 1880s um, uh, sent Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks um, to um, foment nationalism uh, within Tibet as part of their strategy to outflank China in the years leading up to the Sino-Japanese War. Um, the British in the years before World War I, uh, intrigued in Tibet to um, keep um, China from expanding or opening up um, uh, weakness that uh, Russia would exploit. And um, the Americans, um, uh, after World War II and after the, um, the victory of Chinese uh, communism, um, uh, worked through uh, the Tibetan uh, angle. There's a, a book about the fallen heroes of the CIA that describes um, who they were. The first vignette is of an American who took a Willie's Jeep up to Tibet 
uh, with a bunch of uh, money and um, submachine guns. And he was killed, perhaps by bandits, perhaps by the PLA. Um, so this is a well-known history, of course, to our Chinese friends. So it's a source of vulnerability and, and foreign incursion. So sanitizing it, protecting it, is a Chinese priority. Finally, I think uh, there's a history for the leadership uh, with Tibet, particularly Hu Jintao, who had the top civilian party job uh, in Lhasa, um, was humiliated um, in his inability to manage um, uh, protests, um, who suffered from altitude sickness, not a good thing if you're supposed to be in charge of the Tibet Autonomous Region, um, and who wrote a letter to, reportedly wrote a letter to um, uh, Deng Xiaoping after the Tiananmen crackdown praising um, uh, his um, uh, firm hand in the face of domestic dissent. I, I actually had the, I don't know if I'd call it privilege or fascinating experience of spending quite a bit of time with Hu Jintao when I was in the NSC. And I, my own personal opinion is he is, a, he is actually a decent human being um, and a sort of classic Confucian leader in the sense that he cares about the material well-being of his people. But I also think he has deep, deep um, uh, fears and paranoia and uncertainty about ethnic minorities and these kinds of things. Um, it may be some people thought Xi Jinping would be different, as His Holiness has explained uh, to some of us. His father had a particular, um, and in, so, in many ways, more... Uh, flexible view of the Tibet issue. Xi Jinping's public statements on Tibet have not been encouraging, um, but perhaps that changes. But the leadership is another dimension that sort of drives this Chinese view. Um, and then the larger context, of course, is the one that Brahma uh, and Lalit pointed out, which is that, that the Chinese now spend more on their domestic and internal security than on external security. And we know they spend a lot on that. Um, and so there's, there's this larger trend, which is worrisome, um, about um, uh, concerns of internal instability and insecurity, which we saw play out in the drama in the last week um, in, in Beijing. We need to be aware of these. We don't need to accept them, but we need to understand what we're working with. Uh, let me touch on the strategic importance for the United States. I think, broadly speaking, there are two reasons why we should do what Brahma suggests and elevate the Tibet issue in American strategic thinking. The first is the role of values um, and norms uh, in U.S. grand strategy. And the second is um, the uh, geostrategic importance of the Himalayan plateau in the overall peace and stability of the Asia, East Asia Pacific region as a whole. Um, on the first, I studied at SAIS uh, in the late 80s under um, Robert Osgood, great man, um, protege of Hans Morgenthau, champion of realist thinking, in foreign policy. And his famous book was uh, Realism and Idealism in American Foreign Policy. And uh, the whole argument was that uh, the American strategic culture has a weakness for Wilsonian idealism and, and flabby thinking and weak attention to idealistic uh, visions of democracy. And we need to be more like the Europeans and have a realist foreign policy based on balance of power and these hard material factors. And that um, that's certainly what I studied at SAIS. I think a lot of foreign policy experts in this country are trained in one way or another in that tradition, which passes through Henry Kissinger, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, um, and uh, in, in certain ways, I think, in the leadership in this administration as well. And I've, you know, I was a good student and I accepted that, but it always bothered me. And, and, and I've, I've, I've worked in the NSC, I've written on grand strategy, and I've, I've thought about this. And I think it's fundamentally wrong. I think that the American... Uh, uh, influence in the world rests not on separating or splitting off our ideals from our, from our so-called interests or self-interests, but, but rather recognizing that we have a self-interest um, um, in the, um, not only the spread, but the um, uh, success of democratic norms. And that there is, particularly with the rise of, of Chinese power, a challenge for us. Um, because we are not interested, I think, in achieving a kind of bipolar condominium with China. Some people talk about a G2. Um, a G2 is not what Beijing wants. G2 is joint management of the international economy. A, a bipolar condominium, uh, which I think would be more attractive to Beijing, um, is an arrangement where we recognize China's rise and we pull back from areas that are, that are uncomfortable for China, like human rights, like Taiwan arms sales, like Tibet. Um, and we kind of co-manage or have mutual vetoes over security in the Asia region. Um, I think there are some people in this town who would find that an attractive and manageable um, arrangement. 
Uh, I don't. I don't think most of our allies in Asia would either. Um, I think we need to be expanding areas of cooperation with Beijing, but laying down clear markers and recognizing that we need Chinese behavior to change. Um, we can't accept a bipolar condominium where we accept Chinese behavior as it is as Chinese power grows. That's just not sustainable. It's not sustainable morally, it's not sustainable politically, and it's not sustainable strategically in terms of maintaining peace and stability. How do we shape to the extent we can uh, ch Chinese behavior? Well, part of it is bilateral engagement, but an important part is how we engage with the rest of Asia and how we treat issues like Tibet. Um, Tibet matters because it's a demonstration effect for the rest of the region and the world about how, how a strong China will treat a weaker power, or in this case a weaker counterpart, that it has put forward reasonable negotiating proposals within the context of the Chinese constitution and has been rebuffed um, the, uh, in, in negotiations and has seen um, repression increase. That should be a model, or not a model, a lesson for the rest of the states around China's periphery that are concerned about how China will use its power. Um, so we ought to be focusing on Tibet, and we ought, I think, from the U.S. perspective, be, as, 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 as Barman and also Lalit suggested, making this issue part of our strategic discussions, not only with India, but with Japan, with Australia, with ASEAN. I think I worked on the McCain campaign. I'm probably a little bit biased, but I also am friends with and have a lot of respect for many of the people working in the administration now. I think the Obama administration understands Tibet as a moral issue. I don't think they understand it as a strategic issue. Um, I was particularly disappointed, as I'm sure others were, with the deci decision in 2009 to delay um, the um, expected meeting of His Holiness with the President, which seemed like a small tactical move to build a good opening relationship with China, but had enormous consequences. Leading up to that decision, um, the international community's approach to the Tibet question was looking uh, improved. Um, in Europe, um, uh, Chirac and Schroeder, who would essentially do whatever Beijing wanted, uh, were replaced by Sar Sarkozy and Merkel. The Danes, a, a small power, but a very strong power, punching above its weight on human rights and democracy, um, had arranged for the Prime Minister in 2009 to meet with His Holiness. Um, Australia, in 2007, um, uh, Kevin Rudd met with His Holiness, head of the Australian Labour Party, and, and, um, and then, and then uh, uh, Prime Minister Howard met him. I actually was in Australia right before that and met with then Foreign Minister Alexander Downer, who, um, who asked me uh, wh why Australian leaders should meet with the Dalai Lama just because he asks for it. The Americans don't do that. And I said, actually, that's not true. President Clinton and President Bush and President Bush's father, when, when asked, it's not true that the Dalai Lama meets every American president every time he comes. But when asked, when there's, and, and Lodi and, and, and his uh, team are very reasonable about not overloading the system. When asked, there's a meeting. And I, and I think the foreign minister was a bit taken by that. So um, things were generally, uh, I think, in the international front, moving in the right direction. In the wake of the Obama administration's decision to defer the meeting with the Dalai Lama, what happened? Well, um, the EU started getting picked apart, and the Chinese came down on the Danes quite hard and forced out of the Danish foreign ministry a an exchange of notes, a memorandum of, of understanding, essentially drafted by Jay, Beijing, reiterating the one China policy with respect to Tibet. The Chinese threatened to be uncooperative in the Copenhagen talks on climate change and to cut off trade talks. Very heavy handed. Did the rest of Europe come to Denmark's help? No. Did the US come to Denmark's help? No. So the Danes, who were stalwarts, generally got picked off. Um, the um, French also got in trouble and started backing off. Um, and uh, last June, um, Prime Minister Gillard in Australia, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a much criticized decision, um, chose not to meet His Holiness when he visited Australia. So I think there are, you know, in social science, you talk about correlation and causality. I cannot prove the causality, but I strongly suspect that the American decision had a ripple effect um, in the rest of the world. If the American president's not willing to take the heat on this, why should the Prime Minister of Australia or, 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 or Denmark? There are still some pretty strong figures. I, I'm a huge fan of Stephen Harper in Ottawa, who has met with His Holiness, um, and has stood firmly um, in a way that um, is impressive. Uh, Canada's uh, stand on human rights and democracy, and has not suffered in trade ties with China as a result. Um, India's been steady, Lalit's criticism of his own government notwithstanding. Um, but I, I think it's a demonstration of why American leadership matters in this. 
Um, peace and stability in the Himalayas matter to us as well. We are basically a maritime power, we the United States. In the Mackinder geostrategic view that he who controls the heartland controls the world, uh, we don't have much play in, uh, in, in internal continental Asia. We have enormous play in the maritime sphere, um, which is the Mahan and Spikeman view of grand strategy. Um, I just wrote a piece in the Washington Quarterly on the Indian Ocean and the strategic significance of the Indian Ocean to the United States. The National Security Council, um, the Pentagon are studying, doing major studies on the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm a little bit guilty of this too, but we need to think about the um, Himalayan plateau and the inner space and not just think about our strategic interests in terms of the Indian Ocean, which we naturally do because that's what the Pacific Command does, it's what the Seventh Fleet does. We are a maritime power, that's what we tend to focus on. How can we um, refocus our thinking strategically on this? Well, one is to make certain U.S.-India strategic dialogue touches on this issue. A second is in the new U.S.-Japan-India trilateral dialogue, which began actually at CSIS um, as a second track or unofficial dialogue, um, which did focus on Tibet, uh, to ensure that the U.S.-Japan-India trilateral focuses on Tibet. And it ought to be a, a part of our thinking, um, not just the Tibet issue, in the way we traditionally think of it, but in the strategic sense Brahma described it, in our discussions with Australia um, and with other allies um, and with Europeans um, as well. Um, let me end um, with a brief note on um, how um, the, new, the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, Lop Sang Sangye and, 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 and Lodi might play this issue or think about engaging on this issue. Um, I think the the election of the Prime Minister was a very powerful demonstration to the world that Tibet stands for, and the Tibetan people stand for, democratic norms. But it also creates some complications, because governments, like the one I was in, could say, we're meeting His Holiness as a spiritual leader. <laughs> and it gave us a bit of a card that we could play, so that we could do that without saying we were um, uh, uh, violating the one China policy or other things. Um, that's a little bit harder now, but what the Prime Minister can do um, and he's an incredibly impressive and, and intelligent man, is engaged, I think, in discussions with um, uh, experts and foreign policy thinkers here in Brussels, in London, in Tokyo, and elsewhere about the Tibetan issue in this broader strategic context. I think that would be enormously uh, useful and, um, and maybe also help to um, infuse in the discussions among the major powers and the regional powers uh, more attention to this issue, which is morally important but as we've been discussing, um, uh, is going to only get traction when we think about it in these broader strategic terms uh, that you've heard about today. Thanks. Wow. Thank you, Mike, very much, and everybody. Um, we do have someone with a microphone for questions. And as soon as I start seeing hands, I will call on you. And um, if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself and, and really just ask a question, uh, uh, that would be great. Um, I'm going to actually just start. I, I'm wondering. Um, Mike might want to answer this, or the others are very welcome to. I mean, in, in looking for new ways to approach uh, the policy, does, does Taiwan, with all its differences, does the way the United States deal with Taiwan help Indians and Americans and other countries think about how to expand the space, especially in light of His Holiness's transfer of his political authority to an elected government? Anybody? Um, I actually had Taiwan in here, and, 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 and then I got the penalty card. <laughs> um, because you may think, why is Taiwan relevant here? Or why would Tibet be relevant to the Taiwan issue? Um, and of course, His Holiness you know, uh, has many followers in Taiwan and gotten a little bit of trouble in the negotiating process with Beijing by um, uh, you know, respecting that and, 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 um, and speaking up for democracy in Taiwan and so forth. And the reason I think it matters is because uh, strategically, we in the U.S., India, Japan, and others should be thinking of these issues as part of a continuum. I think we're starting to recognize that on the territorial side. We, we've, we in the U.S. have started connecting the dots between what's happening in the Senkaku East Japan Sea, South China Sea, <laughs> String of Pearls. On the maritime side, we've started connecting the dots and comparing notes and coordinating. Uh, we haven't really done it in terms of Tibet. <clears throat> and the reason it's a continuum is because um, our, the, the United States and the international communities stand on any one of these issues. Um, 
I think is read in Beijing on what, as, a, as an indicator of what our stand will be on the others. So there is a view, an increasingly prevalent view among experts in this town that maybe we ought to compromise on our Taiwan arms sales or compromise on the Tibet. In some ways, we have compromised on the Tibet issue. You know, pick a little, back off a little here to make progress there. I think that's a very bad way to approach uh, uh, foreign policy towards China. I think they're seen from within Beijing as part of a continuum, and we ought to recognize that our stance uh, uh, you know, for democratic norms, for um, uh, reasonable, peaceful negotiations, and all the rest of it is 360 degrees and not something we cherry pick so that we can make short term progress on issues like the economy or North Korea. Our instinct in India is to stay steer clear of the Taiwan issue. Uh, we think it's uh, risky to be taking a view on Taiwan uh, where we have no strategic interest. And there's a fear that the Indo-US strategic partnership might even implicate us in US conflicts over Taiwan with China. So I think the, the, the traditional view in India is let's stay away from the Taiwan issue. Let's focus on Tibet. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. We should have more linkages with Taiwan. I think part of this, and what I call a new bold look at Tibet, should also be a bold look at Taiwan. Uh, and to develop contacts without in any way being confrontational with China. And there is much scope for that. Let me just clarify. Sorry. Go ahead, Brahma. For India, uh, Taiwan can be what Pakistan is for China. And for Taiwan to be the equivalent of Pakistan from a Chinese perspective demands a forward-looking uh, Indian approach, uh, which unfortunately uh, India has shied away from. Uh, the fact is that Taiwan can be a very important source of leverage vis-a-vis -vis China, and not to use the Taiwan card is, in my view, wasting an opportunity. Well, since everyone made a, some remark on Taiwan, I think most important is are the Taiwanese, particularly uh, the present government, willing to... Uh, you know, be kind of actively involved in the kind of idea that, you know, you're mentioning. I, I, you know, to be very frank, see a great deal of reluctance. And I, you know, you know if, to be very frank, I'm a little worried because I think it is a great democracy because, in fact, the Taiwan, I think, has given us the opportunity to demonstrate that the Chinese are capable of, uh, you know, uh, adopting a democratic system. So, therefore, it is very important. But... My worry is that, uh, you see, in this kind of effort by the present government in Taiwan to somehow make Beijing kind of, you know, happy, I think they're compromising a lot of issues, particularly in terms of uh, economic hold. You know, I mean, I think it's really frightening how much leverage PRC today has uh, on, on, on Taiwan. So, I mean, you see, uh, you know, uh, I'm very happy that Dr. You know, Singh said about, you know, that India also need to have a fresh look and uh, Brahmachala even went further to <laughs> even <laughs> creatively think about, uh, you know, uh, that India make uh, Taiwan, you know, China's Pakistan. But uh, the most important is where are the Taiwanese, especially the present leaders, are heading? Um, I want to make sure there's no uh, confusion. I'm not actually, and maybe you weren't thinking this either, but I'm not talking about a collective security arrangement or a NATO. In fact, that would be a dumb strategy because we would start forcing countries to choose and we would have defections and, and pushback. Um, my main point is that from a U.S. perspective, um, we should not think that sort of compromising on Tibet will help us on North Korea. These are all part of a whole. But, 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 but also um, on Brahma's point, I... I've, if, I don't know if you've taken the flight between Taipei and Delhi. Um, there's not a strategic or foreign policy person on those flights. It's all engineers and, and Buddhist tourists. <laughs> um, and the connections should be expanded, and it's important. But I think the proxy uh, in, in East Asia, in Maritime Asia, is Japan. Um, uh, Taiwan does bring complications. And, and, and Lodi's right, the Maying Zhou government is, is going to be much more cautious than Chen Shui Bian was about some of these things. But non traditional ties for the economic reasons discussed, would be great. Uh, 
Hi, thanks. Um, uh, this is Andrew Holland from the uh, American Security Project. Uh, my question is regarding the, the Brahmaputra. Uh, two of you had, had talked about the uh, prospects of, of Chinese damming the Brahmaputra, and that, that would be a, a, a big deal and, and a, a very difficult engineering challenge. And they've, they've told the Indian government that they're not planning to do this. Uh, what what uh, have you seen that would lead you to believe that they are, are going to, to move towards that? Two facts. First, the Chinese have already built 11 dams on the Brahmaputra. Now, these are small dams. They do not materially alter cross-border flows. In recent years, they've started work on six dams, a cascade of six dams, further downstream from the earlier dams. Now, these new dams are coming in the area southeast of Lhasa, but not close to the U-turn that the river makes as it enters India. I guess you're referring to this mega dam that they have uh, planned for, and it's at a place called Mithok, which the Chinese have renamed as Motuo. That dam will be twice as large as the Three Gorges Dam. I showed you this map uh, uh, you know, earlier. Just take a look at this map. You know, uh, this map, if you open it on your web link, because this is a map available on, on, the, on, 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 on a Chinese government website, uh, including the HydroChina website, and each dot here has a figure for the capacity of the new dam to be built. And this particular map shows that the Mitok Dam will have a capacity of 38,000 megawatts in comparison to 18,300 megawatts of uh, the Three Gorges Dam. So it'll be more than twice the size of um, the Three uh, Gorges Dam. And we know wh what environmental havoc the Three Gorges Dam has caused. And, and this particular Mitok Dam will be built in, in one of the world's most ecologically sensitive areas. So one has to only go by what the Chinese government and Chinese corporations are releasing. In recent years, they have stepped up road construction and railroad construction to the Mitok area. This is the first sign, the first warning that something is going to happen in that area. A high altitude airport is almost complete near Mitok. So a new highway is ready, a railroad, railroad is coming up near Mitok, a high altitude airport is about to be commissioned next year. What do these, what does this infrastructure development indicate? It indicates that hydropower development will happen in this area. Keep on this side of the room for a minute. Um, the lady, please, the blonde lady. Um, Thank you. My name is Barbara Dello. Excuse me. Oh, can you, Excuse can you just wait for a, a, a oh. microphone? And my name is Barbara Dello, and I just wondered if there are similar concerns um, in kind of the crescents of countries um, above India, and that includes uh, Tibet, and um, in terms of development uh, by the Chinese uh, suppression and resource extraction, where it kind of becomes uh, uh, a, a more widespread uh, concern. Thank you. Um, do you have a quick answer to that? Is it, did, you're talking about just other countries near Nepal, Bhutan. Thank you. We can take it together. I think it's yeah, right. let, the good idea. Let, let's gather a few questions, um, if you wouldn't mind, and, because I think other people will be interested in that. And we'll take that gentleman back there, please. Hi, I'm Kerry Byron with uh, Interpress Service. Uh, thanks very much for these presentations. I think that it's really um, interesting and important to think about these perspectives. Uh, and I think that there's potentially great, much to be gained f you know, within the broader Tibet uh, movement, but I'm wondering whether anybody wants to 
just note whether there's any anxiety or misgivings coming out of either Dharamsala or Delhi with regards to a greater specifically strategic focus coming from the U.S. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Frank Chinuzzi with Amnesty International. Uh, I've long uh, traveled the uh, common road with Ellen Bork, and so I'm glad to be here with her. We traveled to Burma years ago together to see Aung San Suu Kyi, so thank you for the invitation. Um, my question is uh, two-part. Um, if, if, wa if water is the next oil, then a compelling case has been made today that Tibet is the next Saudi Arabia. And so there's clearly a strategic uh, focus that the world should have on the resources uh, of Tibet. Um, but in my new role as head of the Washington Office of Amnesty International, uh, my focus has shifted from grand strategy to uh, individual cases. Uh, and so I was hoping that someone on the panel could also address um, the significance of the human rights situation in Tibet to that strategic dialogue. How do we integrate the human suffering that's going on in Tibet um, and, and ensure that it is not sidelined um, by a, a renewed focus on the strategic importance, which is, I think, both welcome and, and uh, long overdue? Well, I'd, I'd be grateful for someone to jump in that was a, a wide range of, of questions about uh, development, about human rights and strategy, which is what we're all here to talk about. So if anyone has a... Um, I'll take a stab at two of them. Um, on the question of other um, South Asian and East Asian states, views of the Tibetan, Tibetan Plateau, I mean, I, there are um, civil society groups in um, both Nepal and Bangladesh that are concerned <laughs> about this, but those two governments are, you know, somewhat vulnerable. And I would, uh, I don't think uh, Pramila Lali would disagree. I would, I would argue that the balance of influence in Nepal between India and China has shifted considerably over the last six, seven years in China's favor. <clears throat> um, and in Bangladesh and other parts of the subcontinent, Sri Lanka, that's true as well, because these are developing countries that are hungry for what China has a lot of cash. And in some cases, um, not most, but in some cases, the kind of Beijing consensus model of authoritarian development gives them legitimacy. <clears throat> On the other hand, we used to think that about Burma, too. And um, the Mitsone Don uh, 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 decision by Tencent uh, to reverse that, uh, which was another south-north water project, in this case uh, in Burma, uh, the fact that local groups, civil society groups um, protested and Tencent actually reversed the decision was a, a, a shock to Beijing and B, I think something of a useful example for other um, weaker states um, like Cambodia uh, or Nepal even. Um, so uh, that's one reason, although I'm a bit of a democracy hawk on Burma, I think there's utility in, in engaging and seeing where this goes. On the human rights question and grand strategy, um, uh, I think the answer to that is, um, don't just talk about water, <laughs> it's important it is, that the key to the water problem is a um, enduring uh, framework for peace and stability in the Tibetan Plateau, and you cannot have an enduring uh, framework for peace and stability in the Tibetan Plateau without addressing the concerns of the Tibetan people, not just in the TAR. <clears throat> um, that's not to say that um, it's all win-lose for China. I think we, we, we should be making the case that um, that the international community as a whole is engaged in and interested in what Lodi Gary is trying to do. And that not just because of our moral imperatives, but because we see it as a critical step towards stabilizing a region. Um, so I think the human rights is seamlessly connected to the strategic piece. It's not a case we usually make very well, and I hope you're pushing hard to, to have it made. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Chelaney has a contribution. But on human rights and uh, strategy, one has to bear in mind that um, if you look at uh, the history of the last 60 years, uh, Tibet has served as a laboratory for the Chinese government to perfect methods of political repression, which then are tried out in the Han heartland on Han Chinese. 
For example, the post-1959 defilement and destruction of historic and religious places in Tibet then was replicated in the Cultural Revolution. Or take the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. Deng Xiaoping in unleashing brute military force against peaceful student demonstrators merely took a leaf out of the Tibet playbook of the then martial law administrator Hu Jintao, who just two months earlier had brutally cracked down on peaceful demonstrators in Lhasa and elsewhere in Tibet. Or take the current internet censorship in China. Where were the techniques first perfected? On the Tibetan plateau. It was there that the Chinese first tried out their methods of inter internet censorship and monitoring of text messaging. So Tibet has served as a lab to perfect methods of repression. On the issue of water, the problem is that we keep discussing all these different issues. In the meantime, the Chinese government is changing the facts on the ground. You take the Mekong River, which originates on the Tibetan Plateau, the poor, weak states in Southeast Asia keep complaining. The world doesn't hear their complaints. In the meantime, one megadam after another is coming up on the upper Mekong. The last dam completed on the Mekong, Zhuo Wan, it's, it is taller than Paris's Eiffel Tower, and its hydropower generating capacity and, and st water storage capacity is greater than all the dams located downstream in Southeast Asia, just one dam. The next dam, which will be, which will be commissioned next year, is Nwazadu, whose total capacity even, is even greater than Jawan. Now, this is just one river. You look at Salween, Brahmaputra, Irtush, Ili, Amur, series of rivers that originate in the ethnic minority homelands of, of China. And on each river basin, the Chinese are changing the facts on the ground, materially altering cross-border flows. But I think the most interesting aspect, since you're interested in human rights, is the cost, the social costs of such frenetic dam building. In 2007, Premier Wen Jiabao told the National Assembly that between 1949 and 2007, the Chinese state had actually uprooted 22.9 million people for building dams and other water projects. 22.9 million people. That's more than the population of Australia or Chile or Romania or Syria. And since then, officially, they have displaced another 400,000 people to deal with the problems, continuing problems with the Three Gorges Dam. And they have uprooted officially 450,000 people to make way for that central route of the Great South-North Water Transfer Project. So we're looking at more than 24 million people officially uprooted just for building dams. And, and the social and human rights costs of such forcible eviction have just escaped international attention. Thank you. Is there any, any further questions? This, uh, Please, it will take both. Thank you. My name is Tenzin Palki. I work at the National Endowment for Democracy. And I'm really thankful for this very insightful and fascinating presentation on Tibet. Uh, my question is for Mr. Lorila. You mentioned in your presentation that uh, a meaningful dialogue under your watch is unrealistic. But then you also mentioned in the same presentation that the Tibet issue can only be resolved through dialogue. So I was wondering if you can expound upon or explain to us how we can compromise these seemingly contradictory statements. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry if I have uh, contradicted myself. But you see, first of all, the, the dialogue process is a process. You see, it is not about individuals. Uh, it is far more important than, than that. And in fact, the process started long before I even had a role. If you go back, you can even say that this whole process started way back in 1951. You see, on and off. And, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, I played a role. So I was, you know, referring specifically to my role. Because, uh, you know, I think I made it very clear that when this historic transition happened in Dharmashala, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, naturally, uh, you know, had impact on my role, but both the incoming and outgoing Kalun and we met, 
And, uh, you know, uh, I have been asked, I agreed, because since this dialogue process is very important, that, uh, you know, I was willing to do. They are very keen that I continue for some time so that this fragile relation is not lost. That's what I'm referring to. You know, I, you know, tried my best. Uh, but it's been now more than two years since I've been able to go back. And now because of the leadership changes and other factors, you know, this critical and tragic situation on the Tibetan plateau, you know, rationally, I do not see any possibility of, I could be wrong, you know, I could be wrong because you never understand Chinese, you know, of being able to restart a formal, uh, you, know, uh, you know, dialogue in the immediate near future. So that's what I meant, you know, when I said doing my watch. However, when I said that, you see, you know, I passionately believe, you know, I'm speaking as a Tibetan, as someone who has dealt with this issue, that I believe that ultimately, you know, the Chinese, the Tibetans, must continue to uh, make effort. This, this, this is something that should not, you know, give up. His Holiness had worked so hard. I think he has laid very strong foundations that many people, not only, you know, His Holiness and Tibetans, many friends everywhere, here in this town, particularly, you know, a lot of people has put a lot of effort into it. So therefore, I think there is, while I do not see any immediate uh, prospect, yet I know, this I can speak from my experience, a strong foundation has been laid. Uh, so that we must, you know, not be lost. And my hope is that, you know, ultimately, you see, it, it will be, you know, further kind of, uh, you know, uh, stent on that. So I think that, that's, that's what, you know, and I'm very happy, thank you for asking me because, so that I have the opportunity to restate, you know, to clarify my position. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just take this one last question from this lady here, please. Actually, um, well, let me tell you who I am. <laughs> my name is Sayilam Samang, and I work for the Bridge Fund in China, in Tibet. So um, I cannot uh, think about or talk about and act and uh, have these political activities. I'm just uh, trying to think. It's, Think about it logically, and I can share some of my thoughts. The Chinese have a scene, and this, they said, to win 100% uh, win the battles, you have to, one has to understand the other side, and has to understand oneself. So I think um, for the uh, government, the USA tries so hard, it seems like things are getting, getting worse and worse, not getting better. We need a question. Sorry. Human rights and also the, a lot of things. And so um, perhaps I think maybe it's useful to study Chinese culture. Every ethnic group has their own culture, and it's a communist culture, and also Tibetan culture. And uh, also maybe it's good to invite some of Tibetan people and the Chinese people and other ethnic groups to do some like a, a discussion on the policy making instead of just having a couple, I don't know how they make, I don't want to make some um, just guess. The second one is uh, psychology. There's a math method and to treat the people's behavior, which is called negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. So we have to think about whether this um, policy is going to bring the positive reinforcement for the uh, other side, China, Chinese government, or the Communist Party, or the rest of the world, just serial, what it want whoever is doing the negative things, is it going to bring positive, uh, neg uh, positive activities or negative activities? Thank you. And we, also... We, we do need either a question or... And we appreciate that, but thank you. Right. Yeah. Also, thinking this, I think this is a global... Uh, should it, the uh, issue shouldn't be localized. Should it be globalized? Tibetan issue is not, uh, not itself. It's the whole world. Okay. Yeah. Thank so. you. And Charlotte, did you have a question? So anybody's could, thoughts? Could you, it would be useful sure. if you said who you were. I think uh, Charlotte Oldham Moore, I work at the State Department. Just a quick question about uh, your thoughts about the this role of uh, Tibetan cadres inside the plateau now, challenges they face, opportunities that may exist in terms of uh, interactions with them. Uh, thank you. Uh, cadres. Did, did you hear that? Did you? The role. Of the role now on the plateau, uh, your thoughts about their role, opportunities that may exist? Cad cadres, C-A-D-R-E-S, cadres, you know, Tibetan functionaries. Uh, yeah, yes. cadres. Yes. Uh, well, I suppose I, I should try to 
answer that. It's, it's, it's complicated, you know, to, 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 to answer that. Uh, because if I say that uh, the cadres of Tibetan ethnicity uh, are uh, uh, very kind of sympathetic to, you know, the, 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 uh, the Tibetan uh, situation, then most probably I'll be making the Chinese Communist Party re-examine, uh, you know, the uh, background of every Tibetan who is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but let, let me put it uh, th this way. I, I, you know, I have, again, you know, as I said, you know, met with many of uh, Tibetan cadres uh, of a different generation. Certainly I see that the new generation of Tibetan cadres that I have met with uh, are more self-confident. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and th therefore I think, uh, and they are also not embarrassed or they do not feel uh, hesitant to show their Tibetanness. Because unfortunately, if you deal with uh, the cadres that were kind of inducted into the Communist Party system uh, in the uh, uh, late 50s and, uh, you know, 60s. Uh, yes. They are, first of all, uh, unfortunately, don't have a proper educational, uh, you know, uh, qualification. Yes. And also, quite often I've seen very senior, uh, you know, cadres of Tibetan origin. Uh, whenever they make some remark, they are always looking f almost for the approval of a Chinese you know, in many cases, his sort of secretary or assistant who carries his bag. But every time they make such an important remark, they will just uh, look at uh, the assistant next to him uh, to make sure that he or she made the right uh, remark. Even, you know, doing, you know, some of our, uh, you know, official meetings, quite often I find that uh, the elder sort of generation of Tibetan cadres always, you know, read from remarks. Uh, you know, all, all that I think, you know, is changed because with the younger people, you know, they are much more uh, assertive. Uh, I mean, having said that, uh, you see, there are, uh, by, you know, not by choice, are the instruments in implementing the policies of the, you know, CCP. And that policy I need not, you know, explain what it is. Uh, so it may not be fully satisfying. Uh, and I'm sure I can give you even a little bit more uh, uh, detailed reply if we meet, uh, you know, uh, as, as we quite often do. You know, but I think that's that's much I wanted to say on the record. Uh, Dr. Chalini and then Mike, please. Well, related to the issue of Tibetan cadres is um, is a larger issue. There have been these strident calls in recent uh, months by hardliners in China to do away with the autonomy tag for ethnic minority homelands. And some Tibetan communist uh, officials have joined in, this, um, in these orchestrated calls to do away with the autonomy tag. The autonomy tag, of course, has been a sham because Tibetan uh, homelands, uh, the Tibetan homeland and other ethnic minority homelands have been ruled directly by Beijing. But this pretense of autonomy is important from the Tibetan third way approach because the Dalai Lama's third way approach keeps up the pretense that Tibetan autonomy is possible within the Chinese constitutional framework. So in a scenario where you have um, China doing away with this uh, autonomy tag for ethnic minority homelands, that will nullify the Dalai Lama's third way approach. There will be no third way left whatsoever. And I think the way the calls have risen in recent weeks, you know, one senior official after another calling for doing away with the autonomy tag will actually leave the Dalai Lama with no option but to basically declare his third way approach doesn't have any, you know, forward path. Uh, so I think... Um, this, this issue has not um, even received international attention, but I know that Mr. Lodi Yari has been uh, repeatedly warning uh, the long-term implications of uh, 
of uh, you know these calls because these calls are orchestrated and, and therefore they do have support at the highest level and if uh, the National Assembly rubber stamps uh, the removal elimination of this constitutional provision it will have very important implications for the non-violent Tibetan resistance movement because then the younger Tibetan lot that have always said the third way approach is not viable their, their contention then would be proved right and and the Dalai Lama will be faced with a very acute dilemma. On the, on the earlier question, I, um, I do not think that the situation has gotten worse because we've tried harder. Um, I think the situation has gotten worse uh, because of insecurity uh, at the top ranks of Chinese leadership and because the financial crisis has in various ways weakened the ability of many of the rest of us to press our case and because we've not been consistent. Um, I mentioned the decision on the Dalai Lama. I think there were things the Bush administration did, frankly, uh, towards the end that sent mixed signals and the joint statement between President Hu and President Obama in November 2009 promising to respect core interests of China on Tibet, Xinjiang, and Taiwan was interpreted. The intention was not to, I think, retreat on Tibet, but it was interpreted, understandably, as a retreat in Beijing. So there are these external factors, there are the internal insecurities in, in Beijing, and then we've not done great ourselves. We've also not, in recent years, multilateralized and taken this issue abroad to other key states, as panelists said we should. That said, I agree with your central point, which is that we should have dialogue. We should understand the Chinese position. That's why I started with that. And we should have dialogue um, uh, on this issue. And in fact, a few years ago, a, a very high-level Chinese official uh, visiting Washington raised concerns about the Tibet issue and U.S.-China relations, and a number of us said, why don't we have a dialogue on this? Lodi was supportive in principle. We had a meeting here with cadres, Tibetan cadres, uh, scholars, um, and U.S.-China uh, relations scholars. And when we tried to do a follow-up meeting in China, none of the Tibetan scholars on the U.S. side could get a visa from the United Front Department. None of them. They, they accepted one person because this one person, I won't mention names, had been critical of the Dalai Lama's position. Um, in the negotiations. So, uh, so I agree with the principle. I think people who want to try to build um, understanding and trust between the U.S. and China um, uh, can help by encouraging the Chinese side to, to sort of broaden the aperture for who can participate in these kinds of, uh, the kinds of dialogues. This is not about cutting deals on Tibet. Um, uh, it's about exchanging positions and understanding. And there is room for more of that. I, I, I agree. Thank you. I think actually now is a good time to, to break. Um, I would like to thank you all very much. I don't think we've had such a substantive talk on Tibet in, in this town in quite a long time. And um, I hope to uh, see you again and to involve you in, in our efforts to continue raising this issue, especially in the strategic uh, context. And thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to have, I think, the transcript or, and highlights uh, to refer to on our website next week. Thanks again.